Hello and welcome to Free Advice Friday. My name is Carrie Barna from New Shelves Books, and we are here to talk about the business of being an author, publishing, marketing, anything in between that could possibly come up as you are publishing a book, or if you are with a traditional publisher, if you're marketing your book. So that's what we're going to get into today. We do accept questions live. You can join us at newshelves.com forward slash F-A-F any Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern. And we take emailed questions as well. You can email info, I-N-F-O at newshelves.com. We save those questions up during the week and then we answer them on Fridays. And replays do go up on YouTube, which is simply New Shelves Books on YouTube. So you can catch replays if for whatever reason you can't make us live. So we're going to ju jump in with a first question from David. And David's question was, has anyone tried the new Ingram Spark e-commerce feature and or what was the experience or note? So I have played around with the new e-commerce feature a little bit in Ingram Spark. And this came out, mm, it was a month or two ago. So it's been around for a little while. Um, not only have I played around with it a lot, but I've talked to quite a few authors who have been using it in chat groups and things like that. And the overall consensus is that it's very easy to set up that e-commerce link. And what it is, is you can set up an e-commerce link from Ingram Spark and directly from Ingram Spark, it gives you a link where people, you can put on your website, you can advertise with it, where people can go directly to this page that's set up for your book specifically. They can go to it and they can buy your book. Now, why would you do that? The benefits that, um, some people are finding is that they just don't want to support Amazon in some cases. In others, it's nice because you can set a different price. So if you wanted a discounted price that would go directly to you um, or a discounted price that just went to certain customers, you can do that. And then some people like it because it gives them more, um, they are earning a slightly higher royalty. Now, from the customer side is where I see it um, not performing as well. And here's why. So from the customer side, it's a new platform that they're not used to. So it's not something that um, has social trust yet. You know, we go on Amazon, our cards already hooked up. We've already got Prime. We're used to it. So it's an easier ask for us to buy from there. But going through the e-commerce site, we're not customers. We have to get our credit card out. It's a new site. Is it trustworthy? So we have that aspect. The other aspect is, is that by the time you do add on shipping and things like that, which is passed on to the customer, it's not necessarily cheaper. You would have to have about quite a bit cheaper than it is on Amazon to beat the price of buying on Amazon with prime shipping compared to buying, you know, direct from this e-commerce link with the shipping included. Um, so that's one drawback. The other thing that I've seen is that it also does add on sales tax, which is in some ways nice because that way um, the sales tax is added on. And so the author or the publisher does not have to track those sales and pay sales tax separately. So it's a positive, not a negative. But I will say the other thing is that a lot of people are kind of disappointed in is you don't get the customer information. So they can go directly, they can buy from your link, but you don't actually get their name, their email as if they were buying direct. Ingram Spark and Ingram do. So I think that's probably one of the biggest drawbacks of people who have been looking into direct sales is that it does not give them uh, that customer information that you typically get when doing direct sales. So I know that's one big drawback that people, um, I don't think it would keep them from using it, but it certainly is something that would have made them want to use it more and they don't have that aspect. Now, who knows if these things will change over time because um, over time it may be that they kind of adjust things, but as of right now, that's kind of where it stands. So it's a helpful feature. I will say some people have told me it's very helpful to have an e-commerce link that they use specifically uh, to offer discount rates for people who are buying, um, you know, a quantity of books or different things like that. And they do earn a higher royalty than if it was going through, let's say, Ingram, because then the um, wholesale discount gets, kicks in. So I think it's helpful. I think it does allow you to sell direct and control your pricing a little bit more. But I don't think it's quite as good as selling direct if that's what you're hoping for. 
So that's kind of what I've got out of it so far, but it's very easy to use to play around with. So don't be afraid to get in there and set up an e-commerce. I like it literally, I think took me like two minutes to set up a sales page for it. So it's very, very easy. And if you're thinking about it, I would just go in and play with it. Let's see. Oops. Let's see. I'm updating all of my materials. What things are helpful for literary agents, editors, and other pub pros to know about ghostwriters as they work on projects? Uh, Danielle, that's a great question. And as many of you know, because she's been on the show, Danielle is a ghostwriter. Um, some of the things that I often have literary agents, editors, and just people in the industry ask about ghostwriters is how do they get paid? Do they get paid all at once? Is it paid in different sums? So what's the average going rate? What is included with ghostwriting? Um, do they just write everything? Do they do it from notes? Do they do it from videos? Um, I think we see those questions a lot. As far as for professionals in the industry, editors, literary agents, I think the question more becomes what kind of product is put out initially? So is the ghostwriter giving us a first draft? Is this something that's been edited? Uh, how much say is involved? Um, what happens to rewrites if things are not as they had hoped for? Those are the types of questions I see from people in the industry more often. It's not so much about the price as the process and making sure that the finished product is what they want. And then the other question that we see so, so often is timeline about how long does it take to complete something um, with different kind of word lengths or you know, genres. I think those are the things that I tend to see asked the most um, about ghostwriters in not only just people asking me, but also in uh, the groups and the Facebook chats and all of those things that I'm a part of. Oh, David had a follow-up question to that. Are authors replacing the e-commerce from Ingram Spark? the e-commerce link, are they replacing that with affiliate links? Um, so some may be, here's the thing, affiliate links, they're actually earning something on. Now, if you mean Amazon affiliate links, you're not supposed to run ads with affiliate links. So in that case, some people are doing um, direct that e-commerce link to run ads with, but I will say now that Amazon attribution exists, and authors can track Amazon sales with attribution links rather than affiliate links. That's been going on for some time. And so I don't think that most people are going to be replacing that in this capacity. Um, so we'll see, though. Like I said, long term, I know that it's been out for a little while. It'll continue to be developed. Ingram Spark has been very good. As of late, they've been really good about you know, doing customer surveys, having small groups where they're getting feedback from, and then adjusting and changing from there. That's... Last week, you suggested a newsletter freebie for writers for a series. Could be a side story about the main characters. What would you suggest for a newsletter freebie for an author with multiple unrelated books in the same genre? Um, yeah, so let's talk about these freebies that we get Um we give for people to sign up for our email list. I had some interesting conversations today with some clients about this as well. So when we talk about building your email list, I will often say that we use our email as currency. If we're using our email as currency, we don't tend to give it away for free. Um, so for the most part, when people are signing up for an email list, they want something in return. On a lot of sales sites, it's going to be a coupon. Sign up now to get $10 off your first order or, you know, that kind of thing. And for authors, certainly you can say sign up for updates or sign up to be the first to know when this book goes live. And that will entice your hardcore fans. But when you're trying to build your fan base or it's someone who read but maybe isn't enticed by that, you have to dangle a carrot. And in our cases, that's often a free downloadable giveaway. And if you are a fiction author who has a series, I often say, do a prequel to the series, do a intro to a character in the series, introduce that character in a way that someone who's already read your books would love, 
or someone who's never read your books would love, and it could lead them to the series. So either way, either when people are first finding out about you or after they've already read your books, you can entice them to sign up to your mailing list. Now, if you write standalones or if you write, um, maybe you only have a single book and it's a standalone, or maybe you write thrillers, but it's not a series. They're just thrillers. What then? Then you write a short story, the same idea, but in your genre. I've been doing this um, recently with a thriller author that I work with. And it's been doing beautifully, by the way. We've been growing their mailing list by three to 400 people per month with this short story that they wrote. So the idea was, okay, you write thrillers. Let's do a thriller short story. So it's still the, the, the type of thing that your readers can't expect. So rather than ending the back matter with, you know, to continue the series, click here and buy blah, blah, blah. It was, if you enjoyed this thriller, you know, consider this full length thriller. And then we kind of did a promo for the book in the back. And we have seen some sales um, kind of carry over from that as well. We've definitely seen um, a spike in ranking on Amazon and places like that. So we know that it's working and it's growing their mailing list. So if it's thrillers, then, you know, do a short story thriller and do that. If it's romances, then whatever type of romance you write, write a short story there. Um, sometimes it's actually rather than doing something, I like writing something that can go in the front or the back because it does double duty. But I will also say it's very popular in romances, for example, to do like a bonus epilogue or something like that. Whereas after people have read the book, then to get that bonus, that like extra what happened to them a year later or something like that, they have to sign up for your email list. And that's very, very popular, like I said, especially in romance. But then you have to, that's not a way to necessarily build your reader base. That is trying to capture your existing reader base for future sales. I think they're both valuable, but I want to point out that they are different. So those are some things that you might do. Remember, it's so important. We do not give a tease that we give an arc. I want a beginning, a middle, and an end. I want to be satisfied by the time I'm done, you know, reading it. Think of it a little bit like, um, like shorts, um, shorts, like, a, I'm, I'm going to show that I have younger children. Think about it like Disney shorts or like those short little cartoons that sometimes go on the beginning of movies. It's a complete story. It could be three minutes, but it's a complete story. That's really important because if I am left feeling unsatisfied by whatever I gave my email for, I'm going to subconsciously feel like, hey, I'm going to feel unsatisfied with whatever I buy. And that's not going to entice me. So make sure it's something that really, really um, hits home. Make sure that this is not a throwaway piece. This is something that you craft. It is, in some cases, people's first experience of you. It's like your interview with the reader. So you better make it good and you better make it satisfying. Yeah, yeah definitely give an arc. And then I will say for nonfiction. So I was talking to a client who is doing memoir. And I think this is one of those things, memoir like straddles fiction and nonfiction in the sense that it's storytelling. It's not prescriptive how to, because for those things, it's really easy to give giveaways that are checklists. For example, if I write about a book about publishing, I can say, here's my marketing timeline and checklist, download it and join my mailing list. If it is a um, I don't know how how to eat healthy. I can do a 30-day meal plan. But when we're doing memoir, that's where it gets a little bit more difficult and you have to get creative. So one of the things that I was talking to this client about was that if you have a memoir, think about how your story can help or impact others. So in this specific instance, the the memoir is about um, someone finding their birth parents and kind of finding out they were adopted and finding their birth parents. And so the the story is her story of finding her birth parents and, and some other things. But the overall feeling is that it is a story that she wrote partially for herself, but partially to put out into the community of 
birth parents, of adoptive parents, of the things she wished maybe her parents had not known or done, or, you know, people who are in the search for a birth parent. And so we started to brainstorm the different things that could tie into that. And some of the things we came up with were things like the things I wish my birth parents had told me. And that appeals to, of course, the the birth parents, or I'm sorry, the things I wish my adoptive parents had told me. And that ties into the adoptive parents, you know, anyone who might be interested in reading her memoir that are adoptive parents. Um, the, the things that um, I wish I had known to give grace to my parents for, when I was, um, you know, finding my birth parents, different things like that. So we had to get creative in these giveaways, but we wanted it to tie in. It didn't have to be another whole story about her life. It wasn't something made up. It wasn't a how-to, but it was something that was helpful on the same topic because we wanted it to reach for potential readership. And I think that's really important when we're looking at this is if you're a romance author, don't write a thriller and try to get people to sign up for your mailing list. If you are a thriller writer, then, you know, don't do romance. Don't do cookbook. We don't want anyone to sign up for our mailing list. We want potential readers to sign up for our mailing list. We want people who will like our books to sign up for our mailing list because number one, those are the people who you can market to in the future, which is one of the reasons of building a mailing list. And number two, because those are the people who are going to stay on your mailing list and not waste your time or not cost you money because they're on a MailChimp list and they're just racking up your numbers. That's not helpful. That's like, um, I mean, that's just numbers and numbers do not sell books. <laughs> we have to have customer base to sell a book. So when we're giving a giveaway, make sure that when we're thinking of whatever we're giving away, whether it be fiction, nonfiction, memoir, make sure that we're thinking about your potential readers, who that might be. Who do you want to attract? Uh, it's like, you know, that old thing, you put out what you want to attract. It's kind of like that. And so that is kind of what we want to think of. And in some cases, you will have more than one giveaway, you'll have more than one. So for example, with this memoir author, there were three different audiences we really identified. We identified birth parents, adoptive parents, and then people who had been adopted who, you know, were finding out about their birth family. So that was three different audiences that she wanted to attract. So I said, hey, that may mean that you have three different downloads, that maybe you have kind of one that's a little bit more generic, but then you have blogs or something where you call specifically to each audience. Same thing, if you are a thriller writer, maybe you have something that is a bonus epilogue or, and you have something that is just a thriller for new readers. You can do both. Um, and these things, what's beautiful about them, is they work over and over again. <laughs> You can use them for a really long time. I have some authors using giveaways that they've been using and building their list with for five, six years, and it's still doing beautifully. And so that is working really well. Awesome, Erin. Good to see you. Danielle saying, you mentioned that numbers do not sell books. We need a customer base. How do you recommend an author strike a balance of customers while demonstrating platform? This is a really good question. And I think it ties in a little bit to what uh, Marika Flat and I were talking about on Free Advice Friday a couple of weeks ago, that yes, platform matters, numbers matter. I'm seeing this over and over again. I wish it weren't true, but I'm seeing over and over again, where, you know, books are going to pub board or agents are looking at platform numbers. They just are not only platform numbers, but they're looking at engagement. Now, I would say in some cases, engagement is more important than numbers, because if you have 20,000 people on Twitter or X or whatever it is, and, and 70,000 people on Facebook, but you put up a post and no one likes it, no one responds, no one engages, believe me, we notice. And that means that's not an active customer base. If they're not interacting with you on a regular basis, those people are certainly not going to buy from you. 
So yes, numbers do matter. I will not lie. They do. I, there are people who say they don't, and it's not the only thing that matters, but they do matter. Um, whether they're saying that publicly or not, I don't know, but they sure say it to me privately. So I think that's something to consider. And yes, we want those numbers on our newsletter list, on our email, um, on our social media, but they have to be actively engaged. So sometimes you don't have 100% engagement. No, actually, no one has 100% engagement. If you do, come find me. You have fairy dust and we need to be friends. But for everybody else, it's very normal to have like a 20 to 30% engagement rate, uh, kind of across platforms. If you've got 50%, you are doing amazing. So the idea is that we want to strike a balance of, yes, we want numbers, but we want to attract the right customer base. If I'm trying to grow my social media for, you know, to sell a book, then guess what I don't want to build my platform on? People who just want recipes, unless I'm selling a cookbook, because then when I start putting out book content, they are not, they're not going to do anything. So it has to be that balance of engaged, but also building. And it takes time. I, I think Marika said it on our call the other day that it takes easily at least a year. And sometimes it's slow to build, but finding your customer base rather than just numbers is going to take you so much further overall. Um, so I think that's really important. <laughs> uh, Jacqueline's asking, you've probably answered this a million times, but do Amazon ads work? I've heard ads on Google Play and Facebook work better. I think it depends on the book overall, Jackie. Um, but yeah, Amazon ads do work. Now, I think the thing with Amazon ads is that it is very transparent in the point of your book cover, your reviews must be on point. Because when you're promoting a book on Amazon, that's your Doing, you're putting in keywords or you're activating the algorithm to show your book to more people, but you're not getting a full description. They're not going straight to your book page. The first thing they see when they you get an impression, it's called, is they see your book cover, your title, and how many reviews you have in your overall rating. So if you are trying to advertise a book that doesn't have an on-market book cover, you're going to struggle with Amazon ads. If you don't have at least 15 reviews, you're not going to have the social trust and people are not as likely to click or buy. So in that sense, it can be harder for a book. Um, actually, that's one of the things that I kind of test is if I have a book that I think the cover is not working or um, I still don't like running ads with few reviews. I always say 15 reviews is like my bare minimum. But if a cover I feel is not quite on point, I will often say, hey, let's go advertise on Facebook. Let's use a stock photo. Let's not use your book cover. And let's see that if we can engage people with the actual story, if we can engage them with the content first, if they click over to your page, does it convert better than something like an Amazon ad? Do we get people interested in your topic that maybe aren't clicking on Amazon because your cover doesn't jive or, um, you know, that kind of thing. And so that's one of the testers that I use. So do they work? Yes. Now, it's easy to lose money on Amazon. Anyone who's run Amazon ads will tell you it's easy to run uh, or lose money on Amazon. But if you're strategic about it works, I do think that Amazon ads do tend to be more expensive. So having um, read through the series or having multiple books and building your platform. This is why we kind of look at the overall journey of a customer is that if I'm paying for an Amazon ad for a standalone thriller, okay, I get them to buy the thriller, but maybe I'm only breaking even. I'm only going to make money if I take that customer and I get them to buy more books, which is easier with the series than standalone. So what do I do? Well, there's a couple of things I can do to increase that conversion and hopefully make more money on the back end. Number one, doing a giveaway like we just talked about in the back of a book so that person signs up for my mailing list so then I can market all my other books and all my future books to them is one way to make that Amazon ad investment go further. 
Another thing that I can do is that I can give a sample of another thriller, a chapter or two in the back and lead to it. Now, I know I said I'm not a big fan of single chapters. The one exception probably is if you're going to do a sample chapter or two in the back of a book they've already bought because they did not pay for this. This was not extra. This was just something that you're giving them, essentially. That's probably the only time I would use like a sample chapter. So in that way, I am making the investment that I put into my Amazon ads more valuable. I'm getting more out of it. Now, Google Play, Facebook, I will say that you can reach more people. And because you can change up the visuals and the, the what the, I'm trying to think, my mouth is moving faster than my brain, which is impressive because my brain moves crazy fast. So you can change up the visuals and you can change up the actual call to action, the actual words on things like Facebook ads, which does make it easier to test things. On Amazon, you've got your sales page. It, you can change your cover, but you can't change it for every single ad. You can change your marketing copy on your sales page, but you can't change it every day. And you can't try five things at once. You can do that on Facebook ads. You can test out different graphics and visuals and stock photos. You can test out five different um blurbs or calls to action in one ad. So I think in that way, Facebook ads work better because you can manipulate them more. You can do some more trial and error more easily. But I think they both have a spot on Amazon. People are hooked up, connected, ready to buy. So we tend to see on Amazon, while it can be slower at times or um, harder maybe to acquire that customer, I guess is the way I would put it, that the conversion, when you get a click to a sale, the conversion is higher on Amazon because people were looking to buy something. Whereas on Facebook, they're scrolling. They're not necessarily looking to buy. So I think they both have value. For many of my clients, we run both Amazon and Facebook ads. Um, so I think it depends a little on you and your goals, but also that's kind of the pros and cons I see. Regarding giveaways to entice, entice new people to sign up for your website, does that ever backfire and that someone who has been a long-term follower might be enticed to unsubscribe so that they can resubscribe in order to receive the giveaway? Beth, I have never seen that, but I also will tell you that anything that, well, first off, if you are advertising this as a free giveaway, chances are that your existing customer is not going to see that. Like if you're using it in an ad, the back of a book, something like that, chances are that um, they're not going to see that. If they do, however, the way most of these giveaways work is even if they've already signed up, if they put their name and email in, it still delivers to them. So I do not offer anything like a free giveaway. I don't offer anything to a new customer that I would not offer free to an existing customer. I'm already making it free. So I'm happy to do that. So I've never seen or run into that issue at all. Because again, even if they're an existing customer, if they put in their name and email, they'll get the freebie. So I don't think that's an issue. Good. I'm glad that makes sense. Let's see, Danielle with another question. I've recently seen this recommendation. Whatever type of ghostwriting you're selling or services, you should be actively practicing and creating those same assets for yourself. For example, if I'm wanting to write business books, your own should be about business. What are your thoughts on this? Oh, you know how we all kind of say, do as I say, not as I do. Um, yes, I think that you are your own best example. However, I will say for anyone who's ever been in an industry, a service industry where you're creating things, um, you are very often not the priority. I think it's so funny because every once in a while people will be like, oh yeah, do you, do you do all of these things? And I'm like, well, shh, let's not talk about what I do. Let's talk about what we're going to do for you. Um, I will say that you are your own best example and your platform is often the easiest. Sometimes it's harder to show off if you're ghostwriting or something, especially um, I even have it. Certain clients I have, I have an NDA with. I can't talk about me working for them. I cannot flaunt that like, whoa, look what we did because I have an NDA with them. 
And so there are certain things that you don't control those assets. So when you do them for yourself, you can brag on yourself. You can talk about your own assets and it's proof of concept that you're doing it for yourself. So I think that there is something to that. Now I will say that it also takes time though. So for anyone, if you're an editor, if you are an illustrator, anything like that, it takes time to build up your own per portfolio for yourself. And if you've been in the business for a long time, uh, usually you're busy, you're booked. And so taking out the time to create your own things is difficult. I mean, I get asked all the time, oh, where's your book? And I'm like, well, there's about 20 of them on my hard drive. Um, you know, well, obviously they're not just on my hard drive. I'm smart enough to save them multiple places. Not the point. Um, but, you know, when do I have the time? Because, you know, there's only so much. I've I've got kids, I've got a business, I've got clients. And so it is one of those things that I think that it's valuable. I think that sometimes you, you have to make it a priority, but I don't think it's the only thing that can, can help you build that platform. That's my two cents. Uh, I think it is very different being in the industry versus being the author or the writer. Of course, people want to see like, what have you done that's successful? Before I give my money to you, before I hire you, what have you done that's successful? I have people ask me that all the time. You know, can can you tell me books that you've done? Have you made this? Who are your clients? Can I talk to them? And so I get asked that all the time. And I have some very, very gracious clients who um, are happy for me to say, yep, worked with this person, worked with this. They'll give me endorsement quotes and things like that, which really helps. Um, but it is a tricky thing to do when you work in the business. And uh, I think it's funny. I was just reading an article. I don't even remember where it was at. Uh, shame on me. But I was reading an article the other day just talking about how the average author who is a full-time author or who like lives in the business doesn't make all of, or even most of their money on book sales. They will often, authors, well-known authors will make money on editing. They'll make money on speaking. They'll make money on a lot of different things other than just writing their books. And so I think there are more people in the writing industry, not just writing. And I don't say that to minimize it. Writing a book and being an author is amazing. And if you have done it, you are in the elite of the elite, in my opinion. But there are people who, when you're part of the industry, when you want writing and authorship to be your full-time life, many times that means you take on different roles. And so it's hard to balance for sure, I think. All right. If you have any more questions, drop them in the Q&A. We have a couple more minutes here. Um, another question that I had um, pop up this week, oops, um, another question that I had pop up this week, twice actually, was about ISBNs. And you guys know I've been uh, on my soapbox enough with ISBNs that you know exactly what I'm going to say, that yes, you should own and purchase your own ISBNs in my opinion. If you take a free ISBN from KDP, draft a digital Ingram Spark, you are giving away the print and distribution rights to your book. We all know that. I've said this ad nauseum, so I won't go over that again. But a question that I have run into is the idea of secondhand ISBNs, where there are companies who are buying ISBNs. So if you don't know, if you've never actually looked at Valker, which is where we buy ISBNs in the U.S., if you buy one ISBN, it's $125. If you buy 10, it's $295. If you buy, I think it's like 100, it's $500. So they start being much more um, cost efficient the more you purchase. And we're seeing more and more of companies buying, you know, thousands of ISBNs and then selling them to authors. So saying, oh, don't go to Balker and buy that ISBN for $125. I'll sell you an ISBN of mine for $50. Here's the problem with that. It literally says on Valkyrie's website that ISBNs are not transferable. The only way that you can transfer an ISBN is if someone purchases a business and they and the ISBNs are an asset of the business. All of them, not just one, all of the ISBNs or in the case of um, some of a death and they are you know, being passed on in a will. 
So those are the only two ways that you can transfer an ISBN. So when you have these companies that are usually very shady, who are saying, oh yeah, we sell cheap ISBNs, you don't actually own them. They may be allowing you to use the ISBN, but essentially it's the same as getting a free ISBN from Ingram Spark, KDP, Draft Digital, because you don't own the ISBN. The person who purchased it still owns the print and distribution rights ultimately. And I have seen just this month in March, I've seen two cases of someone who bought these cheap ISBNs from a different company. And then you know what happened? That ISBN they bought, it was already in use by somebody else because as they're selling these ISBNs, which they can't actually legally do, they can't transfer rights over, they have done it so often and they're not keeping track of the thousands of ISBNs that they bought that they are reselling the same ISBNs more than once. So then you get an ISBN, not only that's not yours that you paid for, but you can't use. And then these companies are not, in most cases, very upfront and forthright. And then being super nice and giving you a new ISBN, they're saying, oh no, you're out of luck. That's not true. Or we don't know anything about that. You need to talk to Ingram. You need to talk to KDP. You need to, and then you go on this big circle. It is a mess. Guys, for the love, please, if you need an ISBN, if you're publishing, go, if you're in the US, go to Balfour, myidentifiers.com, buy your own ISBN. If you're in Canada, you just request them from the government. Um, North Africa, I think. Um, South, South Africa. I think you can do the government. UK is directly from Nielsen. Like there is one place in each country, just one, where you go to get your ISBN. So please, for the love, go get your own. And also the other question that kind of tags on to that is if you, sometimes you will see with hybrid publishing or vanity presses, where they will charge you for an ISBN. Same thing, they'll charge you for an ISBN and they'll say, oh, well, you can use our ISBN or it's $50 and we'll we'll give you our ISBN. Same thing, they're selling you the use of the ISBN, not the ISBN. It's not transferable, it's not yours. You cannot, you don't have the legal rights to it. You do not have the claim on it. You don't have the print distribution rights that publisher does. So don't fall for that. Um, you know, certain companies are transparent in saying, you know, we own the print and dis distribution rights, but you're going to use our ISBN. That's what a traditional publisher does. A traditional publisher buys all of their own ISBNs and then they assign them to the book because as the publisher, they own print and distribution rights. That's something the author gets paid for in their advance and royalties. This is not copyright. I want to be very clear that copyright is different and copyright typically will always stick with the author. But as far as ISBNs, if you didn't buy it from the one entity or, you know, get it from the one entity in your country that you purchase ISBNs from, you do not own it. Please do not fall for that. It's a hotbed of mess. Yes, and David's making a great point. Purchase more than one. Every format of your book needs an ISBN. So if you have a paperback, a hardcover, an ebook, and an audiobook, I can't do that. So we'll go back to four. <laughs> Um, then if you have four formats of your book, you need four ISBNs, one for every format. So very often buying 10 ISBNs if you're doing a single book or, you know, a couple of books or buying 100 if you know you're going to publish a lot makes sense. They never expire. They never go bad. So it does make sense to buy more than one ISBN, especially when you look at the price uh, kind of worked out there. So most people, if you're doing a print book and an ebook, you'll need two ISBNs. And at two ISBNs, 125 a piece, that's 250. At that point, you might as well get the pack of 10 for 295 because you're going to need them down the road. Almost always someone has a second edition that comes out or they decide they wanted to do a hardcover, an audiobook. Almost always, at least 10 is what I recommend for that 295 in the U.S., Uh, any update on the Audible beta testing, the use of AI-generated voices, project rollout date? Yes, so most of you know that KDP is beta testing virtual voice, which is their AI 
um, system for audiobooks. I think they must have just added it, the beta testing, to a good chunk of accounts. Like they just um, added the beta option because I've gotten quite a few questions about this in the last couple of weeks. So overall, what I'm hearing is that pretty much the same as most AI um, voice. Now with the virtual voice on KDP, it's going to be noted on the sales page that it is a virtual voice. So it is noted. So customers will know. Um, on top of that, the book is exclusive to Audible. So it's not going to be on like Chirp Books and everything else. It's exclusive to Amazon and Audible. Um, and so there's that. And then I have heard that it's pretty good, but it's still virtual voice. So it is AI. Um, it does well with short sentences. It does well kind of with nonfiction because there's not as much emotion behind it, but I have heard it does fall a little flat for high emotion books. So fiction and things like that maybe falls a little flat, but there's no cost to the author doing it. So there's a lot of controversy out there because it is AI and um, there are some people who are like, hey, it's affordable and I can't afford an audiobook, so I'm going to go for it. And there are some people who are um, adamantly against it because it is virtual voice. I'm not going to get into that. I think that that is between you and your God about how you feel about using AI in that capacity. Um, but as far as the actual program, I have heard it's pretty easy to use and um, the kind of, you know, like I said, it's limited, but it's there. I do have a client actually who asked me to explore it for them. So I will get to use, I will actually get to go in there and use that system soon. And I'm very curious to know, I think you actually can test it out before you commit. So you can put your book in and test it out and hear some samples before you commit. And that's what this client kind of wanted to do. So I will have some firsthand experience in the next couple of weeks. And I will let you guys know kind of what I think, but as far as pricing, it will be free. Um, it's a free option, but it's exclusive to Audible. So essentially Audible and KDP, they're going to make their money on the sales of the audiobook. They're not trying to make it on the back end, just like for KDP with publishing, same idea. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. All right. Going back to this idea, um, in my opinion, there is a transferable skill connection between developmental editing and ghostwriting. Any tools, resources you recommend to build developmental editing skills and as a service. So there are a lot of great um, courses on editing. If you go to, um, look, if we weren't talking about it, I would remember the website. Um, what is it called? Look, Erica McIntyre would have my hide for not remembering what this editing website is called. Um, Man, I've just blanked. I feel terrible. EFA, David, David, you're my hero once again. Uh, yes, EFA website. So EFA website. Let me, see. Let me pull it up. So it's the hyphen EFA.org. And it's for freelancers. It's for editors and, and all the good stuff. So they have some classes there and some resource tools for building up your skill and highly recommend that. I will drop the link in here for anyone who is on the call and anyone else. Again, it's the hyphen efaorg um, So great resource for finding legitimate classes and building up your skill. I do think that developmental editing is one of those things because you're developing a story there are resources, there are classes you can take there. Um, you can go through some colleges for editorial courses. And I think that helps build the technical aspect. I will say in my experience, developmental editing specifically is something that people either have a gift for or they don't. Um, so I think it's something that you can always build and get better at. But I will say, I don't think everyone's great at developmental editing. Um, 
in the same, I mean, in the same right, I'll say not everyone's great at copy editing. Not everyone's great at those details um, or proofreading, you know, looking for that little nitty gritty reading slowly line by line. Not everyone's great at it, but I do think the EFA would be a great place to start to kind of build up skills. And I will also say that if you are an author who is interested in doing more of your own self editing or kind of working on your craft and cleaning up what you do, going to the EFA and looking for um, sites and classes. I have a lot of authors who take editing courses so that their writing can be better or so that they can do swaps with other authors and save on editing. So I think there's different options there. And that's where I would start. Yes, and Bob is saying just developing a support group is necessary as it's near impossible nowadays to make a book happen totally on your own. And I agree with that, whether you are an author, you're in the editing business or you're ghostwriting, I will say that it takes a village. I mean, that's why we do this here at New Shelves and we do Free Advice Fridays because it's a community and it's a village of people helping each other out. And I think it's really important to be part of the village uh, in any capacity. And I think whether you're an author and you're doing swaps and beta reads or you're supporting each other or cheering each other on, it can be a very lonely business, either working in publishing or writing and being an author, because it's not something that everyone gets. Like if I sit down at a dinner party, like, yes, people might be like, oh, books, publishing, that's cool. But most people don't actually get it or understand like what goes into writing a book and they don't necessarily want to talk about it. So it can be really nice to have a community and being online just gives us that opportunity, um, being able to go to different conferences and things, writers retreats. I hear it all the time. You know, I went to this retreat and I just came back exhausted, but just so full of ideas and inspiration because you're around people who are feeding that creativity. And so I think it's important to find that wherever you're at, whether it be online or in person. And so that's kind of why we do Free Advice Friday and part of it anyway. So I'm glad that you joined us. We are right at the top of the hour. So we're going to head out for today. We will be back next Friday at 10 a.m. Eastern answering your questions. If you do have questions that you think of throughout the week, you don't have to hold them back. Just email them to me at info at newshelves.com. You, you can just put question for Friday or free advice Fridays in the subject line. I save those up and we'll answer them next Friday. I hope to see you here. Same time, same place at newshelves.com forward slash F-A-F. Have a great weekend and I'll talk to you guys next time. Bye everybody.